Welcome to Let's Hear It. Let's Hear It is a podcast for and about the field of foundation and nonprofit communications, produced by its two co-hosts, Eric Brown and Kirk Brown. No relation. Who else said Eric? And I'm Kirk. And I'm Eric. The podcast is sponsored by the College Futures Foundation, which envisions a California where post-secondary education advances equity and unlocks upward mobility now and for generations to come. To learn more, visit collegefutures.org. You can find Let's Hear It on any podcast subscription platform. You can find us online at letshearitcast.com. You can find us on LinkedIn and, yes, even on Instagram. And if you like the show, please, please, please rate us on Apple Podcasts so that more people can find us. So let's get on to the show. And we're back. Welcome in. It's another episode of Let's Hear It. You found us. We found you. We're all together. Hey, Mr. Brown, how you doing? That's like your catchphrase. It's it's come on. We're bringing people together. It, That's your, if, if, they, if they could make the license plate, the the what do you call them? The, the vanity license plates long enough. That's what yours should be. It's welcome in. Gather around. No, oh no, you found us. We're Glad back. you found us. Welcome We're here. In. We're here. So, speaking <laughs> of bringing people together, Mr. Brown, yes. you've got me. a good one today, and uh, you're headed someplace really interesting, and not that far away from where I grew up in October. So let's talk about Whoa. this. What's, what's ahead here? What What are we about to listen to? Well, this episode is a look forward and a kind of a pitch to all folks out there to go to the Communications Network Conference this year in Kansas City, October 16th to the 18th. And I spoke with Sean Gibbons, the CEO, Tristan Mohabir, their chief of staff, and Carrie Klein, their vice president of community about Communications Network, about the ComNet Conference, all things extrovert and connectificational and that kind of stuff. And you celebrated some anniversaries, by the way, while you're talking. So let's we'll get to the interview. But if I have this right, Sean and Tristan have both been at the Communications Network for 10 years. Do I have that Correct. right? And then Carrie for five. So this is enormous work. And one of our origin stories actually relates back to a common net conference back in the day. Oh, mercy before, for heaven. <laughs> before Sean's tenure. And when the dinosaurs roamed the earth. And I think if we were lucky, there were 40 people in the room when you and I were at the podium that day. And, oh, I uh, totally could have made breakfast for everyone in that room. That's right. That's right. And the so hot now, plate. And, and the guesstimate for attendance for this coming conference is going to be a thousand, something like that, to whatever the yeah, number is. Yeah, a thousand, are. something like that. And, and the big the big thing, it's so it's October 16th, 18th, it's Kansas City. You can still get tickets. Get the, it, it will sell out. Oh. It will sell out, but get get them while the getting's good. Yeah. That's the one thing that I have to tell you folks. Yeah, it's well worth the price of admission. So we'll come back. We'll talk more. But before we go, Sean, Tristan, Carey, the entire team at the Communications Network, all eight of you now, this mighty empire growing in our midst, congratulations, good work, and thank you for all the efforts you put into this. We'll talk more about the importance of the Communications Network when we come back. Let's listen to this. This is Eric talking with the, great, the good folks in the Communications Network and the setup for ComNet 24. Oh, and one more thing, folks. Uh -huh. I want you to listen carefully for the uh, little Easter egg in there. If you're going to ComNet, you want to listen carefully because you could win a prize. <laughs> Let's listen. We'll be back. Welcome to Let's Hear It. I'm so excited for this conversation this week. We're going to be talking about ComNet 2024 and the Communications Network. And my guests are none other than Sean Gibbons, the CEO of the Communications Network, Tristan Mohabir, Chief of Staff, and Carrie Klein, Vice President of Community. Thank you, all three of you, for coming on. This is a huge treat. A huge treat for us as well. Thanks for having us, Eric. Great to be here. Thank you. I want to just dive right in. First of all, I'm going to interview Sean very briefly. And Sean says, like, no, 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 I don't want to talk so much. So, And I really want you to hear from Carrie and Tristan. So that's what we're going to do. But Sean, it just occurs to me that you've had a 10-year anniversary running the Communications Network. Do, do I have, did I, is my math right? You have this correct. And I will remind you that because it's been 10 years, I've been telling the story that you told me when I was hired, which is how do you feel about being a guy with a, you remember how this went? Guy with a sandwich? Guy with a ham sandwich. Guy with, a ham, sandwich. Guy with a ham sandwich. That was how you described my job upon getting hired. I'd say, you know, I ditched the ham sandwich and I've gotten some pretty good company to help me on this journey. I'm pretty grateful to you and everybody on the board and obviously the team that we've assembled over the years, most especially Tristan, because he's celebrating 10 years as well. And Carrie just marked five years with us. Pretty extraordinary thing to say. I, I'm, I'm actually happy to say the ham sandwich 10 years later, probably wouldn't want to eat it. <laughs> 
Well, it could be a 10 year old sandwich. It could be if we stuck it in the freezer, but it'd I have it. You know, it'd be kind of greasy and grimy and green by now. Now the sandwich, I'm sure it's got all kinds of ingredients on it and it's whatever organic and made by nuns tears or seasoning it. It's all the things. It's like, a, it's gotta be, it's like a six foot long hoagie because we're a team of eight now. A team of eight. That's incredible as well. Well, the other thing is a sign of a solid organization is that people stay with it. And the fact that Tristan and Sean are here from a decade ago. <laughs> is kind of amazing and carry your five-year anniversary this is a great team that you put together just for a couple of seconds here sean tell me what are the two or three or four exciting things that have changed over this decade for you running this organization well i guess the first thing would be just the composition of the network it's gotten a lot bigger right so when i started you may recall eric i think we had 400 and some members and now we have over 3,000. Those members were almost exclusively the big philanthropies around the country, which was wonderful. It was Ford Foundation talking to the Gates Foundation, talking to Rockefeller, talking to MacArthur, and so on. But over the last decade, we've not only seen more foundations join, so folks like Chan Zuckerberg and some of the other Knight Foundation and others who maybe previously weren't deeply engaged, we've also seen, and this was part of the board that you were part of, Eric, in 2012, the network board, which at the time was entirely made up of philanthropy folks, made a really brave and bold decision, which was, we think that we aren't doing quite enough to get better at our work. We think that our grantees, nonprofits, are really, because they're sitting out in the marketplace and there's a time of such disruption and innovation, we should be inviting them in. We should be learning and creating a learning community that includes everybody who gets out of bed every day and tries to make the world a better place. And so now, 10 years later, we have, I think the split is actually now starting to tilt towards nonprofits, where we have maybe just slightly more nonprofits than we do foundations, but it's pretty close. That's an extraordinary shift to me. I think some of the programming we've been able to offer over the last decade is something I'm very proud of. ComNet is an essential piece, and the pandemic taught us nothing else. In-person gatherings are just so important. I think it's something that we all missed. But we've supplemented that by creating a whole bunch of programs that I think we're all very, very proud of and enthusiastic about. That's where our growth has come from, is local groups. This idea that sometimes you just need to go borrow a cup of sugar, and it's good to be buddies with someone who lives down the block. So there's 13 cities now where local groups are gathering. Those are organized by network members or managed by network members. And I think that's just a testimony to the strength of the community. More recently during the pandemic, we launched a program called Circles where we said, gosh, as we're getting bigger, wouldn't it be wonderful to help people find the exact right people who can be most helpful to them? So we started to organize these smaller groups that gather monthly on Zoom and all the time on Slack to help each other out. And they're organized around maybe the job that you do, you share a job function, or maybe it's an issue that you work on, or maybe it's a shared identity. And I think in all of those ways, we've helped to start to knit the community closer together and build something that you all on the board had in abundance 10 years ago, which is this incredible culture of generosity and kindness. And so I think maybe some of the things I'm most proud of are the fundamental things that haven't changed and our ability to serve more and more people. And maybe the last thing that I'm really proud of is something I think the board has been a real champion of is that everything that we do, every substantive knowledge-based piece that we do, we share and we give it away for free to everybody. And that was something that wasn't as possible for us maybe a decade ago. And now even ComNet, maybe not everybody will be able to be there, but I promise you everything we do together, all the information that we generate, we will share and we will make available to everybody anywhere all the time. Well, I've said this a million times, but Communications Network is the single most important professional association I've ever had the opportunity to be close to. And it has changed my life. It has absolutely made me better at my job. And it has just brought me a lot of fun and connection with people who are doing great work. And I just thank you for making that thing even more powerful and stronger. Actually, when I started with ComNet way back when, I think I probably could have made dinner for the entire membership if I had a big enough kitchen. And uh, now that's probably not the case. I've seen you cook. I'm (laughs) betting you could feed people. It might be more of a food (laughs) situation just given the numbers. I have no doubt it would be a tasty meal. Look, I think the single biggest thing that's probably most important for us is, I agree, I think it's a really important organization. I'm incredibly grateful for it. Maybe if you ask me to reflect 10 years, it's been a really interesting 10 years. So much has happened politically, culturally, socially, the shifts that we've had the good fortune to witness and some of the scary things we've had to endure. The idea that drew me to the organization and I think draws all of us to the organization every single day is this idea that you can't go it alone. You really don't need to go it alone and you can't go it alone in today's era. We need friends. We get by further and faster with the benefit of friends and colleagues who are invested in seeing us succeed. And that spirit of generosity, I think, is just something that's really sustained me. Fills my cup, I can say that. 
Well, it fills mine as well. And I'm really looking forward to talking about ComNet 24 in Kansas City, Missouri, October 16th to 18th. And as you are listening to this right now, folks, if you're tuning in when we drop the show, there are still seats available, as far as I understand. But it, as we all know, it will sell out. And so this is the first pitch for folks to sign up right now and get your space at ComNet. But let me turn to Tristan and to Carrie to talk about just how you're doing. First of all, Tristan, congratulations on your 10-year anniversary. How has your experience changed over this period of time? Some things haven't changed that much. One of them is just the magic of the network and ComNet in general. That's the highlight of my year every year because the folks who are part of this community are, like Sean said, so generous of time and spirit. I can say that I've made a few friends over the years, some of whom I would consider close friends just through the network. It's been really cool to see the ingenuity and adaptability of the community as well as we've navigated all sorts of crazy things, like Sean mentioned too, chief among them, probably the pandemic. And learning from everybody has been hugely helpful to me on a personal and professional level. And just seeing that growth has been really rewarding and fulfilling. Getting to continue to build platforms and programs to help these people do their jobs better is just an amazing thing to be a part of. And I'm grateful for that. Well, Carrie, you joined in 2019 and then, you know, not that long after the pandemic hit. So you're the vice president of community, but you have been working on the ComNet community since you joined. And I can't imagine what that must have been like for you to have to go fully remote after you you did the first ComNet, I think it was in Austin, and then life changed. How do you build community when you can't get together? I think we all have been working toward that for a while, but what we found is that community is so important and we all need each other and we all can support each other and help each other out that even during the pandemic, we found that folks gravitated to online tools like Slack. We still held and hosted two virtual conferences with a lot of attendees. We had 2000 folks join us for ComNet 20 during the pandemic. Nothing really replaces in real life or in-person gatherings, but things definitely complement it. And a big part of what the pandemic has shown us is that ComNet happens once a year and it doesn't just have to happen that one day. And we're always looking to expand and build our programs to make sure that folks are meeting and gathering online before and after. They can join their local group in the places where they live and work and meet folks within the network that way, but that the network is really always at your fingertips. And while a big focus of ours is the conference and getting folks there, we've seen that not even a pandemic can prevent folks from wanting to be in community and gather with one another. I had a very interesting conversation recently with somebody who joined their job during the pandemic. And I was asking them, how do you build, and this is a someone who works at a foundation, like, how do you build trust with your grantees if you can't see them in person, if you can't go out and spend time with them. This was during that period. And her response was quite interesting. It was a little generational, which is actually, that's okay. We use these tools in ways that allow us to build relationships and get close. And you don't always have to travel great distances in order to see people and build relationships. And I thought to myself, it's so generational because folks who grew up not working on Zoom and feeling the need to be in touch felt really dislocated during the pandemic. And then those folks who are actually born into the technology don't. I'll ask you, Carrie, and you, Tristan, how you can use both of those ways to connect to strengthen the network. I guess the way we do it is there's two tiers of engagement and connection, right? Like we have Slack as our primary digital tool. We have our members community in there now. So folks are in there chit-chatting every day getting help from each other, asking questions, introducing themselves, things like that. I guess it works as a daily cultivation tool to build the scaffolding that our in-person programming then deepens. So whether folks are showing up to local events or ComNet, we have gatherings for circle members at ComNet now. Those opportunities when people can put the faces to the names in real life and go a level deeper, I think they're primed to do that based on what they're doing and who they're engaging with on the circles calls over Zoom or in Slack, or even we just got off a Jones Award call where we're making connections between people. 
And Carrie, have you seen the transition since we've been stumbling out of the pandemic? Have you seen any changes in how people are engaging with each other? A big part of what we focus on is really making sure we're deepening relationships. It's not just like a transactional or work only thing, right? That we want folks to really get to know each other, not just as colleagues, but even friends or humans, right? So I think that because we're trying to focus on these deeper connections, that we all know that if we have a friend who moves across the country, we keep in touch with the friend, right? We don't just all of a sudden not talk to them anymore. I think we've been seeing that Slack and whether it's email, whatever whatever tool you prefer, building these deep personal connections really transcends the tool or the platform or whatever it might be. And at the same time, Slack and email and all of these virtual Google Hang, whatever it is, Zoom meetings, they do really help. They create space that makes things easier and also more accessible. So now you can connect with folks that are not just in, you know, your general area, which is also really nice and important. Well, it's funny. I have to remind myself to go onto Slack. I'm not good at it. I That's not part of my thing. It's like one of those people has to put up a little sign above their computer that says to smile. So it's just a reminder to me that different people get information and connect with each other in different ways. And then if you're going to be an organization that really brings lots of folks together who are different types, you have to do everything everywhere, which sounds a little exhausting, but it also sounds kind of exciting. And the other part that I'm really excited about is ComNet 24 in Kansas City. And after the break, we're going to talk about that, what folks can look forward to, why they should go. And we'll be right back with Sean Gibbons, Carrie Klein, and Tristan Namohabir right after this. You're listening to Let's Hear It, a podcast about foundation and nonprofit communications hosted by Eric Brown and Kirk Brown. If you're enjoying this episode, you may just be a rule breaker. Tune in to Break Fake Rules, a new limited series podcast with Glenn Gallich, CEO of the Stupsky Foundation. Hear from leaders in philanthropy, nonprofits, government, media, and more to learn about challenges they've overcome by breaking fake rules and which rules we should commit to breaking together. We are also sponsored by the Conrad Prebis Foundation. Check out their amazingly good podcast. And we're not just saying that. Stop and Talk, hosted by Prebis Foundation CEO Grant Oliphant. You can find them at stopandtalkpodcast.com. And now, back to the show. And we are back with Carrie Klein, Tristan Moabier, and Sean Gibbons of the Communications Network. I want to talk about Kansas City. Now, last year, some people may know, I missed it. And it was my first miss in 21 years. I I had a family, let's call it a a family requirement uh, that... Can we ask, can we probe here? Were you in America during ComNet last year? I was not. You were winning. Okay. I I was elsewhere. But (laughs) You got a pass. The thing in retrospect, I think I would have rather, don't tell my (laughs) wife, but I think I would have rather been at ComNet. Didn't go exactly according to plan. Wasn't worth it. But I will most certainly be there this year, and I'm really excited. And let me start with you, Carrie. What are some of the things that you're looking forward to at this ComNet? Yeah, well, we're thrilled you'll be joining us this year. I think one of the things we're so excited about is having folks join us in Kansas City. We've not had ComNet in the middle of the country before, and it's been such a pleasure and treat to get to really know the city and all of the wonderful, generous folks in the area. And a lot of our program will reflect that. So we've been working with our host committee, all people local to Missouri or the region, to help build out different sessions. So not only will folks get to be in the city, we're going to one of the super cool museums in the city, the Nelson Atkins Museum for our welcome reception. But folks will also learn a lot more about what's happening on the ground and what's making the city really unique. And then I think in general, we're also always looking to find ways to bring some fun and excitement. So we have some surprises for folks as well this year. Tristan, what about you? Tell me what your job is like during ComNet and then tell me what you're most excited about. My job during ComNet is basically just asking or, well, doing whatever Carrie asks of me and saying yes (laughs) to everything that comes my way from her. It's a lot of running around and a lot of making sure things are set, communications going out, emails, making sure people know where to be, when to be, all the basic information and physically putting things up. What I'm most looking forward to, I would say barbecue, but I'm basically pescatarian. Carrie's vegetarian, but we hear that's good. Just being in the middle of the country in an election year, I think is going to be really interesting and not to sound patronizing, but I think 
some of my favorite comnets have been places that are kind of like hidden gems or that I wouldn't really have gone to before. I think back to Austin in 2019 in particular was just cool, fun city. And when we were in Kansas City last month, we got a little flavor like Carrie mentioned, and it just was a great place to be. So I'm looking forward to some of the conversations that might come up too. I think it's two or three weeks before the election. So I think that's just going to be really interesting. That's such a good point. I was in Kansas City. I did a play in Kansas City many years ago, and I went to this place called the Savoy Grill. And I'm just going to put something out there to the listeners. You send me the best question that you want me to ask your guest of your dreams. And the best question, because I will take you to dinner at the Savoy Grill if you're at Comnet. So there's something out for the listeners. So I'm really excited about that. Sean, let's talk about some of the speakers and some of the sessions that you're looking forward to. I mean, every year it gets better. Right. I think that's the thing I'm so grateful for is that as the network has grown and evolved, we've had the good fortune of every time. I think part of our attitude is if you come to ComNet, you're part of ComNet forever. You're a friend. And we've had that benefit. I mean, even during the pandemic, you may recall Stacey Abrams was on our stage in 2019 in Austin in person. And then in 2020, she was kind enough to lead a session. She actually interviewed Nicole Hannah Jones. So I think the thing that I am most grateful for as we plan for ComNet is that we continue to just see extraordinary organizations being very generous and kind and sharing what they're learning. So this year, among the voices I'm really keen to hear, Heather McGee is going to be obviously talking to us. I think the context of her message, the way that she tells stories, the shared humanity and empathy she has for everybody, I think is a, a model for all of us who do this work. So I think getting to sit and learn and with her and from her is going to be really important. Oh, and by the way, if you want to prime the pump, you can go back and listen to my interview with Heather of last month. But go on, Sean. Keep going. You're on a roll. There's a couple. I don't want to get out over our skis, but maybe this will come out after we've announced this. We have some other really wonderful speakers lined up among them. Our learning labs this year are going to be just amazing. Our board member, Trabian Shorters, is going to be leading a session. The Moth, the big storytelling group, will be with us, and they're going to be teaching folks how to tell better stories. The Management Center is going to be back to offer some special training for senior leaders. There's just... So much on offer, but I'll tell you, Eric, also, fundamentally what I've learned maybe over the last decade is no matter how great the programming is, and we are always proud of it, and we always challenge ourselves to do more and better each and every year, and I hope that we do that. I think that we do that. The thing that for me is probably the most important speaker at the conference will be the person I'm talking to in any given moment, that there's just such an array of talent and skill that comes into the room. You know this because you're part of it. It is literally a gathering of wonderful human beings who happen to be deeply expert in stuff that fascinates me. How do you communicate and get through to other people and do so in the spirit of trying to bring good into the world? That to me is just so inspiring. So my favorite part's the people, and I'm pretty confident the people will be back and it'll be another enriching, beautiful, I mean, I get a little woo-woo about this stuff, but it's just (laughs) such, well, you've been for so many years, you know, there's something that draws us all back. It's really magical. And it's not just the folks up on stage. It's the folks sitting next to you that make the difference. Yeah. And now it is true that I am an extrovert and that helps. But even I have found that folks who are not extroverts seem to come and get a lot out of it. This is not necessarily about going into a room and seeing everybody who already knows each other and there are cliques and you don't feel like you should be there. This is a community of people who are here to help each other. There's one of the joys about working in helping professions is that we are all in it together to try and make people's lives better, improve the environment, make things better. And people are really willing to share with each other. You were, you were telling me during the break, uh, Sean, that the Slack community is almost two thirds of the network membership that people are, and they're, they just go in there and help each other out and answer questions and just be friends and supporters. And that kind of atmosphere pervades ComNet. And that's the thing I've always loved about it. And Carrie, I'll, I'll just turn to you. What are some of the things that you think, are there ways that you help folks who are coming to a conference like this engage with each other? Are there tools or tricks or things that you do to help people feel like they belong and to plug in easily? What are the ways that even the extroverts can make more out of this experience? Yeah, absolutely. So we try new things each year and try to meet our attendees where they are, right? Knowing that folks are coming with all different ways of wanting to engage But really, we spend a good amount of time thinking about how can we make a big conference feel small? 
And so we're trying to create small spaces where folks can naturally get to know each other. An example would be our day of service. So we have a couple different volunteer opportunities this year where small groups, anywhere from six to eight people are going to go out and do some volunteering within the community. And of course, they're doing some good, which is amazing. And also, they're also having a smaller group of fellow ComNet attendees to get to know. It's much easier probably getting to know a group of six or eight than it is a group of 950 if, if you're more of an introvert. So we're looking at all of the different ways people are going to be gathering what they're going to be doing and how we can infuse, whether it's discussion prompts, we will be having different discussion prompts on all of our tables just as a way to spark discussion. We'll have some networking bingo. We find folks really love to gamify things. Again, not everybody's going to do this, but the few folks who might want an easier way to start a conversation can find these things helpful. We will also in all of our learning labs and all of our breakout sessions, we're very intentional that all of the presenters know that we want folks within the audience to engage with each other. So there's going to be a lot of turn to the person on your right or left and chat about what you just learned, those types of things, just making it feel very warm and welcoming. We actually are going to even have a keynote that specifically is going to be talking about the importance of connection and deepening relationships, being generous and expressing gratitude that is not really just a lecture. Folks in the audience are going to have to do a couple different exercises where they'll collaborate with each other. So really just building that into the overall program and also kind of meeting folks where they are and knowing that not everybody just wants to go to a general mixer, but creating different spaces and ways to engage. I love that. And I know how thoughtful you are about that. Now, Tristan, I'm going to put you on the spot. This is, I think, maybe now your 11th ComNet. But some, some of them were virtual, but... I guess so. Yeah. 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24. Yeah. It's 11. We, we, it's a good thing you have 11 fingers. <laughs> Do you have a favorite ComNet moment? A favorite ComNet moment? Oh, please say the chalk in San Diego. Please say the chalk in San Diego. <laughs> that was probably my least favorite ComNet moment. Well, this is back when we were a staff of two or maybe three. So, you know, we just had less folks to do things. And I got tasked with putting out signs and chalk to lead people to the beach where our opening night reception was, which was amazing. That was amazing. But it to be like 95 degrees that day. And, you know, and I'm in my blazer and whatever, <laughs> like literally blazing that day, I guess. So that was not fun. There are too many to name, but I think one that really stuck with me was Desmond Mead's keynote in Austin, just because his presence or aura, I think, as the kids say these days, was <laughs> just amazing. And his personal story and how he used that to affect social change. So his organization, Florida Rights Restoration Coalition, won the Jones Award that year for their work to get voting rights back for returning citizens, which I think was the largest expansion of voting rights since the Civil Rights Act. And that was just amazing. Like the entire room was just absolutely captivated and blown away. So that was really, really special. Well, you know, you were kind enough to let us record that. We captured it as a podcast episode. So if you go way back into the archive, you can find that as well. It was an incredible moment. And Sean, how does it feel that Tristan is talking about what the kids say these days? I mean, I, I rely upon Tristan and Carrie to tell me what the kids are saying these days. <laughs> I need to make sure that my drip is fabulous. <laughs> well, just parting thoughts. I'll, I'll just ask you, Sean. Why should people go to ComNet and send us out with a rousing speech, Sean, that you're good at that? Oh, man. Uh, except when I'm called for to do so. <laughs> it's kind of like, be funny. Oftentimes it gets harder immediately afterwards. What am I most excited for? I think it's kind of the thing that I felt every year about ComNet, which is, and I really don't mean to insult anybody because I'm sure there's some folks listening who plan conferences, but my general disposition is most conferences suck. Yeah, right? I, I, I'm going to agree with you. I've been a few that are good, but a lot of them are not. Well, it's just, it's so curious, right? Because it's some people, presumably, who are very well-intended and passionate, spend an inordinate amount of time planning this gathering for a whole bunch of folks who presumably are like-minded and gathering because they share an interest in some issue or idea or whatever it may be. And yet, when you arrive, you discover there's hundreds upon hundreds of people who presumably should be potential friends and colleagues. And yet it's oftentimes, at least this has been my experience, one of those sort of disoriented and very lonely experiences to go to a conference. And so what am I maybe most excited about? And it's the thing that I think we can never look past and that we always have to be mindful of 
is the thing that Tristan pointed to earlier. And it's sort of, again, it's this woo-woo term, but it really does, I think, I can't come up with a better adjective where it's the magic of combat. It's that place where the culture comes to life. You know, we can talk all, all we want about asking people to be cool and to be kind and to show respect and give grace and ask questions and seek solace and solutions and all the rest of it. But folks actually do that at combat. Like, that's the thing that astounds me. Is And it also, again, it fills my cup. It gives me so much hope and, and appreciation for just how many really lovely, kind, well-intended humans there are walking the earth. Because sometimes you could flip open your phone or whatever, and and the world is coming at you with a lot of bad news at a great velocity. And combat is a place where you suddenly realize, like, yes, there are 100% a tremendous number of challenges that are facing us. And there always have been as humans. We're always facing something. But to be surrounded by and informed by and lifted up by, you know, nearly a thousand people who all roll out of bed to make the world a better place and who seem to be genuinely invested in, in not only succeeding themselves, but helping others do so. I don't I don't think you can put a price tag on that. And so it's it's not to in any way malign other people's gatherings. It's not to say that the programming and the planning that we're doing right now isn't important because all those things are true. It's essential. But the reason I suppose I would come to combat if I had not been in the past was I don't know that I would take it from some disembodied voice over my device telling me to come to this thing while you're walking your dog while you're walking your dog. <laughs> But I would say, sincerely, you are welcome and you belong. If you're listening to this podcast, chances are you're interested in the work that we all do. You understand the importance and gravity of it. You understand the complexity and continued disruptions that occur in our field every single day that seem to be accelerating. And all of that is a little unnerving and unsettling. And so to have the luxury of a few days with other people who are maybe feeling those same feelings, but are committed to getting better and to thinking through ways to be more effective in their work. I come home from combat and I look at two beautiful little girls and I think I know a whole bunch of people who are invested in helping them live in a better world. I'm a little bit of a student of Fred Rogers and I am a big believer in the helpers. And I will say ComNet is a gathering of helpers and I am all for that. Yeah, I could not agree with you more. Obviously the bar is high for a communications organization to put on a good conference because oh yeah there's that too because everyone who shows up is put on their own and so they're judging which makes it fun for us because it gets i don't want to say it gets spicy but we definitely are always challenging ourselves to innovate and get better yeah yeah you need to know our friends are watching yeah just my wife says yeah okay mr communications how come you didn't tell me that thing right but and i i just thank the three of you carrie and tristan and sean for your commitment to this work for making this organization what it is i am so excited about Kansas City. I will be there with bells on. If you haven't signed up to go, sign up, talk to your boss, get them to pay, have them give me a call. I will I'll give him a, a sales pitch. Have him, have, Sean, have him give Sean a call. He'll really give a sales pitch. Thank you to the three of you. Thanks for your work. Thanks for coming on the show. And I will see you in Kansas City. You will, Eric, if you will indulge me, if I can give a quick shout out. So oh. there is obviously the three of us have been doing this work, but I want to just acknowledge the incredible work that Lalise and Kareem and Alyssa and Amy from our team are all doing, and Jess Black, who's organizing our locals, it takes a village. And it's not just the eight of us on the staff now. It's it's the literally thousands of folks who are stepping up into leadership roles. I mean, a big piece of how we see the network evolving is there'll never be enough of us who do this as our day job. We need everybody in the community. And what's been so beautiful is to see how many different people have stepped up in such really interesting and meaningful ways to continue to build and grow the community. So in a lot of ways, it's like huge props to the folks on the team and on the board, but also just to everybody in the network. Thank you. Like it's such a beautiful thing to see. Thanks for pointing that out there. It does take a village as they say, and a staff that has grown to really interesting and fascinating proportions and for all the right reasons. Yeah. So thanks. Thanks to all three of you. I will see you in Kansas city. Thanks for having me. Thank you. And we're back. So, Eric, revisit the Easter egg. I want you to surface it. I want you to talk about it. And I don't think you're, I don't think you're going to make good on this, by the way. I don't trust this oh. for a second. I don't trust oh, this for a second. Oh, contraire, mon frere. <laughs> the Easter egg is, for folks out there who are going to ComNet this year, send me the best question that you could ask to your favorite guest. The best question that you could ask to your favorite guest that we should have on Let's Hear It. So it can't be Gandhi, you know, <laughs> why like, 
don't you really want a cheeseburger? No, right. it has to be a real question to a real guest that someone we should have on the show. And the, from the hundreds of thousands of submissions that we get, if you're at Comnet, I will take you to the Savoy Grill for dinner. <laughs> now, the Savoy Grill has a very, very, very special place in my heart because when I, in my former life, well, three, three has-beens ago, I was an actor and I was in the national tour of On Golden Pond. <laughs> and we played Kansas City in the spring. Ring, I think it was of 1981, hmm. and we ate dinner. We had a steak at the Savoy Grill, which oh. is a place like Dillinger, with you know yeah. whatever he did things. And Harry Truman hung out, and there's this fabulous old uh, historical restaurant. And I I've been dying to go back, and I would really like to take a favorite listener who has <laughs> one hour contest because they're at Comnet, and all of the stars have aligned after 43 years. Isn't that something? Well, enjoy that dinner. That's going to be an incredible meal. And can I say there were a lot of interesting disclosures in this conversation, but here, but this is, should. but hearing that this was the first time that Comnet has come to any location in the center of the country was really interesting to me. And, and I'm actually so glad that the communications network is coming to a place like Kansas city. And as the, as the native Midwesterner on this podcast, let me just throw out that there are a number of other venues, options, alternatives. Dubuque. There's a bunch of cities out there, a bunch of great Wichita. places. Right. Now, maybe you, we could do Enid, Oklahoma. You might do be have nice. to connect some, you do have to have connecting flights. And I think that's a hard <laughs> thing when you're doing conferences, you want to spare people. You want to give people the direct flight connection the opportunity. There's, hey, look, there's a Calistoga wagon. That leaves San Francisco every third Thursday, and you can take it across the country and stop in Kansas City. <laughs> get wherever you want and to go. And it's a direct – it's direct. You don't have to connect. You just get in the wagon, and then you get to Kansas City You know, a month later. So I want to suggest that there's a really important word for this whole conversation that we should reflect on. It was mentioned briefly in your interview, and I want to blow it up a little bit. Lonely. And I thought it was really interesting how Sean, Tristan, and Carrie talked about how the team at Comnet has worked at the Communications Network has worked so hard to make Comnet a place where you can foster connections. I love that idea of a big conference made small. You're doing small group work. But let's face it, this work, this communicating for social purpose and social change work itself can be very lonely. And I was thinking about this sensibility you're coming to this conference finally, and you and I have joked about this on this podcast, our families, our parents, they don't know what our jobs are. They're totally confused. Yep. Now, suddenly, yeah. <clears throat> suddenly I'm in a room with a thousand people who know this job because they're doing it too. Before we've said a word, we have that deep understanding, that sense of alignment. They understand what I'm doing. I understand what they're doing. Even if our topics or issues are totally different. To me, I feel like that's been one of the incredible things. Somehow, Sean and the team at the Communications Network has been able to pull that thread forward and help people leave these kind of isolated little you know, silos of activity and bring them together in all these different ways. And my goodness, it just, it just struck me. And again, Sean and Tristan for 10 years, Carrie for five, and the rest of the team growing, helping people address that fundamental loneliness of like, I'm trying to make this world a better place, but I'm kind of doing it alone. To me, that's just an incredible contribution that that group is making. And you know, the feeling of finally someone who gets me. Yes, right? Exactly. And you can yeah. learn and, and, and it's a it's a friendly environment. People, And then you get to pop in and out of these different learning labs. The way they've just built that scaffolding of relationships, I think, is incredible. I agree. And it, I think that this is really interesting. The notion, first of all, we were talk, we talked a lot about Slack, which if I'm working with a client who's on Slack, I'm on Slack. If I'm not, I'm not. So I'm maybe not the best audience for this, but there are a thousand people out there using this thing on a regular basis, at least <laughs> maybe more. I think he said 2000. So people are connecting that way. And then circles give you the opportunity to find that thing that you're interested in and use that as a common denominator. And that thing might not necessarily be the work that you're doing. It could be, could be environment or it could be, it could be an interest that you have so that you can learn about how to communicate about that. Or you're just connecting with other people who do your job or a different job in your profession that care about that thing too. So it's just another way to connect. And I think that the network has done such a good job of finding all of the different ways that people connect and giving them an opportunity to do it. Cause it's not just being good at one thing. You kind of have to be everywhere because 
that's people get their information and they connect in totally different ways. And though a lot of people who have been members of the ComNet for communication network for years and years and years, haven't been to a conference. It's not how they, right. That's not how they do it. You know, that's not their thing. And that's fine. Then there's folks like me who, yeah, I, (laughs) I come early. I stay late. I'm one of those people. (laughs) And by by Friday, I'm completely wrung out and ugly, but, but I've had a wonderful time and I've learned a lot and I've been able to share things and I've been able to connect with people who I've only known as something in my inbox. And that's, I love that. I absolutely love that. And I missed it last year and I'll never forgive myself. Was that the only com net that you've missed? Yes. Oh my gosh. So you've made 20, what, what number? I don't know. Since 2000, I think 2003 was my first one. And I went every single one since. Well, I hope for last year and. I hope you keep it in the edit because when you were cutting a break, you had this little aside with Sean where Sean came back around the Slack piece. And I do think we need to hit the beats on these numbers a little bit. So Sean's reflecting that the network itself has grown to like more than 3,000 entities. It's not just foundations. It's foundations, nonprofits, practitioners more generally. They found all these great ways to organize people. So it's through the conference, yes, but it's at the city level. It's through these different circles. It's it's just I, that notion of, hey, let's just jump on a call. You and I share the same job title. Let's just commiserate. Let's just, let's just you know, yeah. think about the projects, challenges we're, we're facing that are similar. But also then the, the piece about Slack that was talked about in the break. So please keep it in the edit. I hope it makes it in the I, edit. I don't know. Who knows? Well, but this Sean's like, you know, actually. If you don't I, hear the thing that was in the break, then we didn't. This is it. this is what Sean says. That it, it was. You have to ask me about it at ComNet. Ah. It was, yeah, he kept over dinner, over dinner. But, but it was over this, dinner. this great moment where, you know, it's like break and all. Actually, Eric, can I just come back and tell you the Slack thing? We've got 2,300 people. Two thirds of our network is actually connecting through our Slack channels. And again, you're right. You're like saying, well, Slack's not for me. I use email, I use different modalities. And you're right. You've got to be in all these different places, support this expression all these different ways. And for the communications network to just be systematically trying to solve this problem, it's so interesting to me that this notion that the entire social change, social purpose, let's communicate together space. We're all yearning, pushing at this shared mission, and yet we don't, we don't actually necessarily find each other unless there's somebody out there trying to help build these bridges and to listen to the intention with which those folks at the communications network, the, the effort they're putting into doing this well, it's incredible. They got they should write a book about it. Well, here you go. This is me. Come on, else do some work. Paint your fence. Write your book. Right. Write your book. Communications right. network. Yeah. Oh, they should write a book. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. There you go. Not me. And, and by the way, yes, I co- I communicate. I communicate in very sophisticated ways. Carrier yeah. pigeon and Vulcan mind meld. There those are the two. Those are my two tools for communications. And this podcast. So, <laughs> what do you think? And by the way, this podcast was a tremendously good idea. But what? Well, that doesn't have to be stupidest idea you ever had. So, what do you think about this notion of deepening relationships? Because to me, that was really new and different. And I've flown in and out of, we've all done it. You guys talked about it on the in the discussion. So many conferences, they're kind of lonely. They're kind of dislocating. Maybe you've got your little group of folks that you know, but you're in this kind of vast arena of who are those other folks. And the, the people, the communications network saying, you know, actually, we want this to not be transactional. We actually want you to have the real relationships that come as a result of your participation in the work that we do. My goodness to deliver on that promise, how valuable that is, but also how challenging. But I also think it's a new insight. I just don't think that when you and I were coming up through the ranks, our professional peers and mentors necessarily thought that way and necessarily thought to try to equip us that way. What what do you think about that? I did seek out ComNet because that's the sort of person I am. I'm I'm going to be crowd i'm gonna be whatever mosh pit crowd surfing or something i'm gonna <laughs> like i'm gonna just jump into the pile but but that this organization is the thing that has helped me create almost every single meaningful professional association who have become deep personal friends people i trust with anything i will call them up and show them my stupid strategy or this thing that i wrote or float an idea off of or some crazy person will say, hey, let's do a podcast together or whatever. <laughs> and and that's that's how I connect. It's how I learn, but it's also how I uh, go in the world. Mm-hmm. And I do think that these personal connections are so valuable because it does give you that place where you can try things out, where you can be unafraid to express new ideas, to think things through. 
and people are warm and wonderful and loving, and we are not in competition. And we're not trying to steal market share from each other. We're not trying to steal, in, you know, IP from each other. We're all in it for the same types of reasons, and we're in it together. And that's what this thing is about, and that's why it's so much fun. Well, to answer this question, is this job hard job or easy job? Whatever the job what is. Job? Whatever you want Who's to characterize it. This notion of communication for social change and purpose, easy to do or hard to do? Easier to hard to do. Incredibly difficult. Do you have oh, good? I got that right. Do you have too many resources or too few resources? <laughs> typically, do you have too enough money or too right? Do you, do you have money? Do you have enough? Oh, people, do you have enough people on your team? Or do enough people? Times quiz. That's for sure. Yeah, it's, it's hard. <laughs> this is something we do it's that's really hard. hard. <laughs> who else is going to share sensibility about that than somebody who actually shares that burden in whatever context they're working that same issue from? Right. It's so it's just. It's just, I love that they're doing this work. I love that they're pulling this together. Well, this is just incredible work. And again, you you mentioned it in passing. I don't want to say it again. Even as the communications network team grows, and Sean was did a great job of pointing out, yeah, there's a lot of people. There's a lot of friends. There's a lot of collaborators. We get a lot of help. The communications network organization is growing. There's a bunch of great people there. But for Sean and Tristan to be at this for 10 years, carry for five, you know, that that ability to hold people, have them continue to grow. It doesn't sound, by the way, that Sean is in any way feeling like uh, he's done with this gig because it's been 10 years. And actually, I bet that the job he has today looks nothing like the job he had 10 years ago, let alone even two or three years ago. So um, it just seems like it just continues to be a really rich and rewarding place to work. And just just all credit to the people there that have been doing this work all this time. I totally agree. This is exciting stuff. And uh, and again, you know, the communications network, when we were setting up this podcast, that was one of the first calls we made, right? Was we got Sean and his team together. So what do you think? They were supportive. And exactly right. lo and behold, we were going. So that's the kind of thing that's happening to them every day, all day, hundreds of times. People come forward. What about this? What about this? And they they greet it all with a sense of generosity and support. And that's that's a lot. And it's it's helping thousands of people help. Think about this. Millions, hundreds of millions of other people. Yeah. And here we are. 47 yeah. years later on this podcast. <laughs> here we are. I, you know, I think we're closing in on our 100th episode, but I haven't checked. Isn't that great? We were just, you know what? You just keep. Put the you just buried the whole lead right there. It's funny, you know. I uh, I uh, saw uh, REM just got uh, adopted into the Songwriters Hall of Fame, and apparently uh, it was Bill Barry on that team that was like the one who just kept them going, kept them churning out songs. And I was like, oh yeah, that's Eric Brown on our team. That's, that's the person churning playing. out songs like REM. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> just one hit after another. One hit after. So Communications it. Network, thanks for joining us. Thank you so much, Sean, Tristan, and Carrie for being on the podcast. Comnet twenty four. Coming October 16 to 18 in Kansas City, Missouri. Check out Des Moines Island next time. But uh, it's coming, and uh, please get your tickets. There, there's a few remaining, and it will be well worth the time and the effort to participate. And again, kudos to the Communications Network for saying, yeah, and if you can't, if you can't pay to come, we'll make sure you get all the content for free after. What an amazing contribution. So, Eric. And don't forget to send in your entry for this grand prize sweepstakes. The best question for your favorite interviewee on Let's Hear It has to be someone who's interviewable. <laughs> the best question wins, and, and and Kirk will decide what the best question is. It will, we'll accept uh, We'll look for photo documentation of this dinner for the, at the Savoy Grill. All right, you you got it. Photo documentation. Well, Eric, thank you for doing that. Our colleagues and friends at the Communications Network, thanks for joining us on the podcast, and thanks always to all of you for listening to us. Yeah, and then we'll see you in Kansas City. We'll see you next time on Let's Hear It. Okay, everybody, that's it for this episode. Please let us know if you have any thoughts about what you heard today or people we should have on this show, and that definitely includes yourself. And we'd like to thank our indefatigable producer, Harper Brown, John Ali, the tuneful and inspiring composer of our theme music, our sponsor, the Lumina Foundation. And please check out Lumina's terrific podcast, Today's Students, Tomorrow's Talent, and you can find that at luminafoundation.org. We certainly thank today's guest, and of course, all of you. And most importantly, thank you, Mr. Brown. Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Brown. Okay, everybody. Till next time.